The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The reading is from Isaiah. The Lord has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the worry with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled up my out my the beard. I did not hide my face from insults and spitting. The Lord helps me because therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who has vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them comfort me. Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who would declare me guilty. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye is consumed with sorrow, and also my throat and my belly. For my life is wasted with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength fails me because of affliction, and my bones are consumed. I have become a reproach to all my enemies, and even to my neighbors, a dismay to those of my acquaintance. When they see me in the street, they avoid me. I am forgotten like a dead man, out of mind. I am as useless as a broken pot. For I have heard the whispering of the crowd. Fear is all around. They put their heads together against me. They plot to take my life. But as for me, I have trusted in you, O Lord. I have said, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face to shine upon your servant, and in your loving kindness save me. The second reading is from Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every, kneel, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, 
to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, Not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. While Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, he sat at the table. A woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard, 
And she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, Why was the ointment wasted on this, in this way? For the ointment could not have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me, for you always have the poor with you, and you, you show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand, beforehand for its burial. Truly I tell you, whenever, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray Jesus to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So Judas began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus. On the day of the unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat at the Passover? So Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he go enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as Jesus had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, Jesus came with the twelve, and when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, and one is who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one after another, Surely not I. Jesus said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man, as it was written of him, but woe to that man, one by whom the Son of God is betrayed. It would have been better for that one to, not to have been here. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night, before the, clock, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter said vehemently, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of the disciples said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to the three disciples, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, Jesus threw himself on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Jesus came and found the disciples sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, why are you asleep? Could you not keep awake for an hour? Keep awake and pray that you may come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again Jesus went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found the disciples sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. Jesus came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? 
He knocked. The hour has come, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See my brother, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately while Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given the crowd a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away into guard. So when Judas came, he went up to Jesus at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then the crowd laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out of the swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of Jesus' followers deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following Jesus, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. The crowd caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed Jesus at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against Jesus, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent and did not answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? The whole council condemned Jesus as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy. The guards also took Jesus over and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But Peter denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what, who you are talking about. <clears throat> and Peter went out into the forecourt. Then the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again Peter denied it. Then after a little while the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, if you are a Galadean. But Peter began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know this man who you are talking about. At that moment the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And Peter broke down and wept. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused Jesus of many things. Have you no I answer? See how many charges they bring up against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, Pilate used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then Pilate answered them, Do you want me to release you for you, the king of the Jews? 
for he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call King of the Jews? The crowd shouted back. Crucify him. Pilate asked them. Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more. Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led Jesus into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed Jesus in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him, and they began saluting him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. The soldiers compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry Jesus' cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then the soldiers brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And the soldiers crucified Jesus and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified Jesus. The inscription of the charge against him read, the King of the Jews. And with Jesus, they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided Jesus, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, uh -huh. you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking Jesus among themselves and saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of the Israel, come down before from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with Jesus also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Aloy, Aloy, lema shabbatani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filling a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to Jesus to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come down to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. Truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger and of Joseph and Salome. These used to follow Jesus and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if Jesus were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether Jesus had been dead for some time. When Pilate learned from the centurion that Jesus was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. Joseph then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid. This is the passion of our Lord.
I just have to get through this tough spot, and then everything will be better. How many times in life do we say or at least think something to this effect? I just have to barrel my way through the school or work week and get to Friday night. We just have to white-knuckle it through this pandemic until everything opens up again and goes back to normal. I just have to grit my teeth through this unpleasant physical sensation until relief comes. I just have to deal with this season of consternation and grief until I feel better. I have many times fallen victim to this in terms of the spiritual life around this time of year. I just have to make it through the season of fasting and penitence until we can all kick up our heels at Easter. The list goes on and on, right? I'm probably not alone in having entertained thoughts of this sort about any number of things in life, more times than I can possibly count. And it's understandable. There are many moments in life that are uncomfortable in bodily, mental, or spiritual ways, and sometimes all of those at once. And sometimes they're even not just uncomfortable. They feel practically intolerable. I have the utmost sympathy with the just get through it pattern of thought in moments like these. But I have to wonder if, in thinking this way, we're cheating ourselves out of something that God really wants us to have. This is the Sunday when, every year, we read the entire Passion story out of one of the three so-called synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, or Luke. This year we got Mark's version. And these stories occupy a huge space in each of the Gospels. It's often been said that all four of the Gospel books in the Bible are really just passion stories with an extraordinarily long prologue. And each year as we rehearse this pattern, I find myself wondering, why do we have to do this? Does Christianity really need to be such a cult of death? Let's just get through this rough patch until the real party starts with the resurrection. But this year, more than ever, I realize that this is completely missing the point. A close read of the Passion stories reveals so much more than first meets the eye. Yes, there are the inescapable features of betrayal, violence, and excruciating pain. But none of these is the main point. No matter which of the four evangelists we're reading, Jesus' words and behavior make it clear that he is nothing like the ordinary victims of the crucifixion. There is no cursing, no begging, no bemoaning his fate. Rather, there is an air of power and triumph that, if anything, increases while he is on the cross. He refuses wine and myrrh to dull the pain. He responds to the taunts of bandits and passers-by with grace. And when he does eventually give up the ghost, the Gospels are very clear that he gives it up. It is not stolen from him. Not so much in my youth, but in recent years, I have discovered a fascinating phenomenon. 
When time and circumstances allow, I like to push my body relatively hard. I do workouts that tax and hopefully increase strength and endurance. I climb mountains that offer fairly severe challenges to body and mind. And what I have discovered is that with practice, the elation I used to feel only once such a challenge was surmounted and done, I can now feel early. In other words, I can find great enjoyment right in the midst of the challenge, even in the midst of substantial pain. And this does not apply only to physical things. Those moments when mind and spirit are troubled and challenged have the same potential. I have discovered that when I'm in a moment of perplexity and fear, I can also, counterintuitively, tap into a sublime kind of joy. This has taken a great deal of practice. In fact, if I stop practicing, I easily slide back into old patterns. And ultimately, it has been God's grace and not my own initiative that has enabled any progress whatsoever. But this, I believe, is the great subtext of the passion story we hear today. Jesus is showing us that heaven doesn't need to wait. Yes, there is absolutely a future promise in the story. After death comes resurrection. After pain comes comfort and relief. But there's just as much promise for the present in this story as there is for the future. The promise is that with a strong connection to God, we can already experience heavenly joys and comforts while the pain, the fear, and the uncertainty are still with us and not yet resolved. We can live entirely into the promise that Jesus made to one of the bandits crucified with him in some of the other Gospels. Today, you will be with me in paradise. We, too, can be with Jesus in paradise today. Not tomorrow, today. When we manage to get ourselves into this state, I believe that we finally get to enjoy what God desires for each and every single one of us. That not one single moment of our lives is wasted on just trying to get through it. Each and every second is infused with divine power and joy. Even a moment of dereliction, where we might be tempted to quote Psalm 22 as Jesus did, and ask, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what a timely message this is. There is so much fear and uncertainty around us right now. And many of us are feeling outright pain, be that physical, emotional, or spiritual. But I am convinced that with prayer and practice, God can and will grant all of us what was granted to Jesus even, perhaps especially, during his passion. God will grant us the ability to find an unmistakable sense of power and joy that does not wait for the pain and the fear to subside, but is with us right in the middle of them. To put it in the strongest possible terms, Heaven will break into our hell and overtake it completely. 
This is the promise I invite you to take out of the passion story today. And I invite you also to take a practice. Start with the small things and work your way up to the more challenging ones. At a moment when your body or your mind might be tempted to go into fight or flight mode, but one where it's still fairly easy to call yourself back, use it as an occasion for prayer. Remember that the word spirit translates literally to breath. Breathe deeply and regularly, and as you're doing so, be deeply conscious of the fact that you are literally taking the Holy Spirit into yourself. Thank God for the gift of that Holy Spirit and pray that she helps you to find power and joy in the very moment. I am confident that this practice and prayer will be rewarded and that over time all of us can move further and further into a state where none of our life is wasted just trying to get through it. I don't believe that Jesus found so much as a single second of his life on earth to be a waste, not even the seconds he spent on the cross. And I believe that God desires for all of us to enjoy this state just as he did. Now, before concluding this message, I need to offer one final note. Several members of our congregation have noted to me recently that in a message like today's, I may be ignoring a key fact. The fact is that there are many, many people around the world who are suffering greatly. And at least some of that suffering can be traced directly back to the behaviors of privileged societal institutions most of which exist in a land such as ours. Many of us in this part of the world, including even our churches, participate, often unwittingly, in these institutions. I completely recognize, therefore, that in light of this fact, likening ourselves to Christ in his passion has its limits. If we're honest with ourselves, and this is true to varying degrees of all humans, we're sometimes more like the ones doing the crucifying than the ones being crucified. But this makes the sort of spiritual self-care I'm encouraging all the more important. As the adage goes, hurt people hurt people. Cultivating a state of connection with God and the joy and power that goes with that is not coddling ourselves. Rather, it's enabling ourselves to turn away from the individual and collective behaviors that harm others and the planet we inhabit. And instead, as the, today's beautiful reading from Philippians said, take on the mind of Christ. So I leave you with the same encouragement. With the Holy Spirit's help and guidance, do as Jesus did. Practice joy in the midst of pain. Practice divine connection in the midst of fear and dereliction. Soon you will discover that what you practice becomes your normal reality. And you're doing this not only for yourself, but for the life of the world. In awe of the passion of our Lord, let us pray, saying, O Christ, Hear our prayer. 
O God, who made your blessed Son manifest to all the people of the world, and bid him to preach peace to those far off and those near. You call your people to unite in worship that we might receive the power to become your children, divine beings in whom your word has hands and feet. Pour out your blessing upon the church throughout the world that gathers for this purpose. Send this blessing, especially today, upon the Anglican Communion, including Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Church of Hong Kong. Pour out your spirit also upon the Episcopal Church and our diocese, including Michael, our presiding bishop, Mark, our bishop, and El Buen Pastor Church in Redwood City. Let your blessing also come to our fellow faith assemblies, especially the Livermore Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. O Christ, hear our prayer. O God, in whom mercy and justice embrace, we ask for your love to take wings in all the nations and peoples of the world. Bend the hearts of all nations and peoples toward peace and righteousness. Send your spirit especially upon Joe, our president, Gavin, our governor, Bob, our mayor, and all who serve in legislative assemblies or judicial roles in this and every land. O oh Christ, hear our prayer. O oh God, in whom mercy and justice embrace. Sorry about that. O oh God of perfect health and wholeness, in this time of pandemic and fear and uncertainty that surround it, we lift up to you all those who care for the sick and the suffering. Pour out a special blessing upon all who follow your call to care for others in body, mind, or spirit, especially all first responders, for all nurses, doctors, police, firefighters, and educators, and especially Brad O and Brad S. Give them the gifts of courage and joy in their work and protect them from all adversity and harm. O oh Christ, hear our hear prayer. Our o word made flesh, this congregation gathers together as a people inspired by your first coming and looking for your coming again. Bless all its members with the gifts of hope, wisdom, and compassion. We lift up to you especially these members of our weekly cycle of prayer. We pray for Aaron, Sue, John, and Hiroko. And we commend also to your grace and protection those in military service. For Aaron, Joey, Abigail, Valerie, Amber, Christopher, and Taylor. O oh Christ, hear our hear prayer. Our prayer. We pray also for all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially those who have requested our prayers for healing and wholeness. We pray for Olivia, Becky, Brett M., Carl, Carol, Kathy, Chalopi M., Dave R., David, Dawn and Wendy, Aaron, Esteban, Miroslava and Tamara, Glennis, Geraldine, Helen, Umberto, Candida and family, Janice, Jim and Janet, Josh, Joanne, Lisa B, Luke, Marge and family, Marie R, Mary L, Mary M, Marissa and family, Monty, Judy, Nick, Nina, Michael, Sandra, and Henrietta, 
Sarah, Michael E, Sylvia P, Steve W and children, Tamara S, the Sweeney, Rudolph and Plemons families, the Herman family, the Purcell family, the Moon family, the Ruzika family, the Boer family, and the Montgomery family. And we wish healing prayers for all of God's children who have gone missing over the years. May you all be rescued and feel God's warm love for you. O oh Christ, hear our prayers. Lord Christ, in your passion and resurrection, you made death the gateway to new and eternal life. Pour that life upon all your servants departed this life, especially Jennifer R., Sharon H., Linda G., John M., Marie R., Vern P., Joan B., and Elda M., and raise them to everlasting glory in your kingdom. O oh Christ, hear our hear prayer. Our and now, O oh Christ, in eager anticipation of your coming kingdom, we pray to you with hearts and voices for our other needs and concerns, and we offer you thanks for all the blessings of this life. For those in Iran, Iraq, Yemen, Israel, and Palestine. protect all those who are targeted for violence and contempt on the basis of their ethnicity, especially our sisters and brothers of Asian descent. Oh God, we thank you for the gift of prayer, the gift of time set aside to offer you thanks for all blessings and to ask you for those things that we desire and need in life. And we just pray that you would give us that sense, the elation and the joy of answered prayer even as we await the full consummation of all that we ask and desire. This we ask through him who is the fleshly answer to all prayer, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Dear friends, before we conclude, uh, just a couple of words. First of all, if you are tuned into this service and not as familiar or connected with St. Bartholomew's Church, I bid you a warm welcome. My name is Andy. I'm the pastor and priest here, and uh, if you are one of those people, I would love to get to know you. Please do use the contact information on the church website to uh, reach out to me by email or telephone, and I would love to find out more and be able to welcome you even more warmly into this family of faith. A um, couple quick words about logistics this upcoming week, this afternoon at 2 o'clock. We will be gathering for outdoor worship. Um, this service is an anti-Eucharist, which means it will conclude momentarily with the peace and a concluding hymn. 
uh, but we will have the full uh, Palm Sunday service outdoors tomorrow, uh, today, excuse me, Sunday the 28th at 2 p.m. and all are invited to participate in that. You will be able either to remain in your cars and receive the service on your car radio or sit outside where there will be speakers to amplify the sound so that you can hear that. Um, we will be doing the same thing again next week for Easter Sunday at 2 p.m. and also there will be recorded worship available in the morning on the website as well as our virtual coffee hour. We also have a full set of Holy Week services scheduled on Thursday the 1st of April at 6 p.m. There will be interactive Zoom worship where everybody is invited to participate in the Maundy Thursday service from their homes. On Friday, recorded worship will be available at 6 o'clock in the evening, the Solemn Liturgy of Good Friday. And from noon to 4 that day, the St. Bartholomew Sanctuary will be open for all those who wish to do a self-guided meditation on the Stations of the Cross. Uh, given the circumstances of the pandemic, this will be something that either individuals or households do separately from one another this year, as opposed to together. Um, and then uh, the recorded service for Easter will actually be the Easter vigil service complete with a baptism. And so in that way, we will be completing all of the standard Holy Week and Easter vigil services. And you are warmly invited to join all of that. You will be receiving emails and resources will be available on the church website. All that being said, my sisters and brothers, May the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also, also with, with you. you.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.